Hi, welcome. We're just going to uh, wait for a couple of attendees to start arriving and then we'll introduce you to the talk. Hello, those of you who are joining us. I'm going to wait uh, perhaps about a minute or so to um, see if anybody is checking into the Zoom. Uh, I'll introduce myself and our guest speaker and then we can get started. Okay, well, for those of you who are already here, uh, welcome to our talk on climate change. Um, it's part of a webinar series that we're running this week with a number of our academics. Uh, my name's Zoe, I work for the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Um, I'm joined this evening by Dr. Francesco de Godice, um, who's going to be doing a talk on the role of chemical engineering and what that might look like in the future. Um, before I start, um, this isn't a talk aimed specifically at any year group, but if you are thinking about applying to the university in the next year and you have any questions about admissions or how to get in or anything to do with the side of living at university, um, please feel free to pop a question in our Q&A. Um, I'll hang around uh, until after the chat and I'll be able to answer these as well. Um, also, in the meantime, if you have any questions on Dr. Del Gudice's presentation, feel free to pop in a question in the Q&A. Um, but without any further ado, um, I will introduce you. So uh, Dr. Del Gudice, if you uh, would like to start the presentation, that would be great. Hello, good evening. So let's start to see whether the screen sharing works. Okay. So can you confirm, can you confirm that you see my presentation? Yep, it's all good. Great. Okay, so we make a start. Um, welcome, first of all, and thank you very much because there were so many other things that you could be doing at this time in the evening. So thank you for deciding to spending some of your time with me tonight, with us, with me and Zoe. And uh, we're going to talk about the role of chemical engineers in tackling global challenges. Okay, so... First of all, I know that you maybe already know this, but I always was wondering uh, when I was your age, uh, uh, what a chemical engineer does. That, that has always been like one of my question because I always thought that a chemical engineer was a person that was spending most of its time in the lab. So that, that, that's basically what a chemical engineering looked like to me. But was making an incredible confusion because I was uh, uh, mistaking the chemist with chemical engineers. So there is a substantial difference between chemist and chemical engineer and can be represented by the difference between this image that you see now on the screen and this other image that instead is the representation of several pieces of equipment. Now you may say, well, what, what does this mean? Can you please provide us a practical example of that? Yes, I can. And uh, the example is the COVID-19 vaccine. So we all know that the team at Oxford Sorry, the team at Oxford developed the COVID-19 vaccine inside a lab. But what you get inside the lab is a tiny, tiny circle of containing the vaccine. How do you scale that up to billions of doses distributed worldwide? And the answer is chemical engineering. Chemical engineers are people that take the dreams of chemists and make them re and realize them by using processes. It's the same thing that the chemists, they wanted to have that vaccine delivered worldwide and chemical engineers provide the facilities like the one that you see here to develop the vaccine on a billion doses to reach the whole world. So if we want to actually look at what a chemical engineer is, we can look at, for instance, this is the definition uh, made by the Institute of Chemical Engineering that says, chemical engineers create and develop the processes to produce, change or transport products and materials 
They use their knowledge of mathematics and science to investigate problems and design solutions for issues such as safety, efficiency, and sustainability. This is a lot of words. So if we have to actually highlight the one that are the keywords here, what I would say is that chemical engineers create processes, investigate problems, design solutions, and uh, basically they focus on items such as sustainability. Okay, so this is a loose, a sort of loose uh, definition of what a chemical engineer is. So then the question would be, what are they doing to improve our life? What are we doing to improve uh, the life of everybody? So I'm gonna just uh, uh, go uh, around four challenges, four global challenges, and I will um, uh, tell you how chemical engineers are actually solving and uh, addressing those issues. And I will use examples from the research that we carry out here at Swans University. The first one is a hot topic, is climate change. So we all know what climate change is because many people are talking about it, but I don't know how many of us know where it's coming from. So for instance, if you look at the reaction that I wrote here on the, on the left of the slide, this is the reaction between methane and oxygen. And this can be basically the combustion reaction among any other type of uh, uh, fossil fuel, methane, ethane, propylene, etc. And all these produce CO2 and water. Methane and others are used to produce energy, but at the same time, they produce CO2. Now, the CO2 accumulate in the atmosphere, as is reported here in this nice uh, schematic, and then the ray from the sun, they come to the earth and they are not able to escape, just basically creating a greenhouse. So basically the radiation, the heat coming from the sun, is trapped because of the presence of CO2 that uh, prevent the, ra the radiation to go out in the universe, which means that all this heat lead to an accumulation of uh, heat on the earth, thus leading to the problem of uh, uh, global warming. So the temperature is rising. So what are the issues associated with this? Well, this is taken, this graph from the Net Zero Strategies so published a few days ago by the UK government. And this is the strategy. So the strategy, they want to get the wind, nuclear and solar energy, and then goes in the electricity generation to then uh, go in building, in transport and industry. The same thing they want to get from natural gas, they want to get hydrogen and then use the same thing across the public transport and industry so that they can reduce the use of coal and oil. So just to keep the minimum of oil and we want to go to net zero so that basically all the CO2 that we actually emit is then captured so that in the atmosphere there is a net of zero. Okay, so this is basically the strategy. And there is a reason why this strategy should also be addressed. This is a graph that shows uh, the behavior of the GDP from the 1990s until 2019. You see that in the UK increased the GDP by 78% compared to the rest of the G7 at, that is on average at 72%. And uh, at the same time, UK is the one that reduced most the emissions to minus 44%, which means that there is also a, an economical advantage of reducing the emissions, okay? So this also lead to increase of GDP. And uh, there is then a challenge of how to do it. So we have to remove CO2, but we need energy. So one way to address this is to use hydrogen. So if we take hydrogen and we make it react with oxygen, we produce water and energy. There is no trace of carbon dioxide, dioxide anywhere to be seen. The problem is how do we get to the hydrogen? Because it's not as easy as the methane. So one way to get to the hydrogen is actually get the water, add some energy to it, and then by electrolysis to reduce, to remove and separate hydrogen and oxygen. So basically what chemical engineers have developed is basically you take energy, it goes on a catalyst that is basically made of hydrogen and the oxygen catalyst. So there are compounds to basically facilitate the release of oxygen and hydrogen. When you add energy, this system release oxygen and hydrogen. And this hydrogen is then used to produce energy according to the first reaction. Now, this has been developed inside the lab, 
Okay, so it can be the work of a chemist, but what the chemical engineer did is actually a unit that is currently active here at uh, Port Talbot. So this is a container. It's a container where there is a there are these red parts that we will see soon in action. And inside the container, there is this system that basically is used to convert to, um, basically this system takes the wind energy. So the wind that is in Port Talbot, and for those of you that have ever been in this area, they will know that it is a very windy area. This will make these uh, red parts to rotate. And then uh, this energy is used to separate hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen is then used to uh, generate energy. In this way, this, in, this plant have saved 245 kilograms of CO2 in a year compared to the use of gas. So there is a video that will uh, tell you how this works. Okay, it's a short video. So let's watch it just briefly. So you see the winds, there is the noise, the, the noise of the wind that is activating these red pulse, and these red pellets, and this is basically make, make producing the energy required to separate hydrogen from oxygen. And this is one of the example of how a change in energy and how developing this solution is part of the chemical engineering degree and chemical engineering skill set. Okay. The other problem is drinkable water. So this is taken from, um, uh, from a stats that relates to the number of deaths by risk factor in 2017. Now, you would never expect to see access to drinkable water among one of those since we are in the 21st century. However, unsafe water source still cause 1.23 million of deaths just in 2017. And what is worse than that is that uh, UNICEF in 2015, estimated that 600 million of people, so it's more than half a billion of people, did not have access to drinkable water. Now, what does this entail? That if we look at figure A and B, for instance, this is a, an image of Rio Las Vacas in Guatemala, where the sea is highly polluted. So the water here is highly polluted. If there is no filtering system, this water end up straight away in the houses and people drink this water. And this cause fatalities, this 1.23 million of people. This is of course, not just in Guatemala, but it's also in other places. In, in researcher here at Wons University develop a system based on membranes where you actually get this water. This is a highly polluted water, like the one that you would get here in um, Rio Las Vacas. And by using this membrane that you see here, they obtained clean water. And the great thing is that they were able to actually derive a DIY system that you can basically go and buy in any bricolage shop, and uh, you can build it also in remote areas or in areas where they do not have access easily to drinkable water, so where there are no plants. So this is a kind of impact that is making on the population. This is chemical engineers doing. Another thing is that is the mining industry. So Wales has a strong history of mining, but the mining industry, uh, we have several mines that are abandoned. The problem with mines is that there are a lot of minerals and these minerals pollute the water and the same water goes into in the water system. So if we do not have in place the water treatment places, all these metals go straight out of our tap. So what instead chemical engineers here as once have developed are systems like the one here that I'm highlighting with the arrow or this other one here, one that is in North of Wales and other in Germany that is basically used to, to purify the water from uh, uh, abandoned mines. And this is a type of impact that affect positively the population. This is something that chemical engineers do. Sustainability is another great one. So it's another type of things that we need to look at as chemical engineers. So if we take fossil fuels, fossil fuels are the main uh, product, uh, not the main product, the main reagent for the production of plastic. So we get fossil fuels, we convert them to plastic in uh, let's say 8,300 units of plastic, 2,500 are used, 600 are recycled, 800 incinerated, 4,900 units are discarded. This account for over 60% of the plastic produced that end up 
discarded. You know where this plastic end up in the world? Here, it end up in the five plastic gyres that basically are also called the plastic continent because uh, due to the direction of the streams, okay, of the water streams, this plastic discarded goes and form islands or continents of plastic. And the plastic here does not degrade. It's just polluting the water, killing the ecosystem. And we do not have at the moment a way to reduce the use of plastic because plastic makes most of our things. So many of our things are contained in plastic. So there is a shift towards producing paper boxes, but still we are surrounded by plastic. So how do we address that? The solution that has been developed here at Swans University is a very clever one because what, this is one of the dream of chemical engineers. Uh, so take something that is a pollutant, that is a solid waste, or even a liquid waste that contains fossil fuels, and via a chemical process to convert all these in carbon nanotubes. Now, I'm pretty sure that at least once in your life you have heard regarding uh, carbon. For instance, this car is made of carbon. Uh, so this means that it's light, in uh, a very strong chemical property, uh, sorry, uh, very strong mechanical properties, and is very expensive. So imagine to convert solid and liquid waste in carbon. So in something that is useful for the planet. And you know what you do with this carbon? For instance, you can power a light, a bulb. You can power a bulb. You can produce cables that make your Wi-Fi connection much faster than broadband, up to 100 megabit per second. And this is also highly resistant to the te high temperature. So it's, it's not flammable, it's a very incredible material. And you can also do all another thing because you can also transport sound in it. And I will show you an example of this. So this is basically back cello suite number one in, in a G major that is uh, processed. So the signal, you see there is a pin here, a jack that goes in the computer, but then this part here are carbon nanotubes. So the carbon nanotubes can also transfer sound to a speaker. So this is a very versatile material and has been here produced from waste. And then let me touch upon another pillar, healthcare. This is another important one, healthcare. So you may think what have chemical engineers to do with healthcare? Can chemical engineer really do something for improving healthcare? The answer is yes, but we need to abandon our basic notion of healthcare and start to dig a bit further. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples. And we use the, the one of the problems that chemical engineers are solving is the problem of strokes. So stroke cause 100,000 deaths in UK each year. We have 1.2 million stroke survivors in the UK. These are statistics from 2018 is one of the four, is the fourth biggest killer in the UK. So we are talking about is in the top five killers that cause death in UK. This is a serious issue. And uh, we may think that doctors may address it, that um, uh, medical engineers may be addressing it. And this is correct. They are doing, of course, their, their bit, but also chemical engineers are contributing in solving this issue. We have to start from one thing. Not all the fluids are the same. Let's just briefly look at this video and then observe very clearly what this person is doing. Okay, just watch the video and then we come back in a second. It's a short one. <laughs> This person did something incredible. He was able that and when he was stomping on that liquid, it was not sinking. If you try to do that on water, you sink. There is no chance about it. But if you do it on that liquid, you don't sink. If instead, when he stopped, he began to sink. 
which means that not all the fluids are the same, because if you try to do that in water, you don't succeed. And I'll show just one example regarding that. So we call some fluid a Newtonian and some other non-Newtonian. So a Newtonian fluid is something like water. And let's see what happened here if I steer water. So if I, here there is a magnet that is rotating and it's basically steering the water. And you see there is a vortex that form downward, okay? So it's very clear. There is a very nice uh, vortex forming downward. It's actually one of the textbook problem in chemical engineering. But if you said change the fluid, look instead of what happened. Now this road is rotating and look, the fluid is climbing, is actually going the other way around as the water. This is one example of non-Newtonian fluid. These fluids that you see here, the properties of those fluids, they are studied by chemical engineers. And coming back to the original question, why are you telling us this? What has this to do with the healthcare? Surprise, surprise, the blood is a complex non-Newtonian fluid. If we know how the blood flows when subjected to, you know, uh, to a flow, how to respond when subjected to a flow, like steering, for instance, we would be able to determine and to know more regarding that sample. So this has been employed in the context of stroke. How? This is a schematic of how a stroke, a blood clot would look like, okay? So there is fibrinogen that basically form an agglomerate around red blood cell. And this is forms a clot. Now, what you can do is an experiment that if you take the blood from people that are potentially having a stroke and you put it between the two plates that are parallel and you start to do this, you see this type of moment when you have one plate that is still and another one that is moving. And you can do this at different frequencies. So this is, for instance, very high frequency. And this is at very small frequency. If you start to do that, you actually get the, that after a certain time, the, this system move from a sort of liquid type of things to instead be having like a solid, so something more rigid. For instance, this is the same thing that when you have your jello, okay, your jelly, if you shake the jelly, then it, it, it seems like more of a liquid. Then when you put it in the fridge and wait, it will come back to a jelly is like a solid. So if you wait over time and the blood does a very similar thing. So if you experiment at different frequency, you can identify this point that is called gel point. And this point is related to the microstructure of the blood clot. Especially you see that these two A and B have two different shapes. Now, in, uh, if you run a conventional test on this blood, so tests that are available in hospital and are the gold standard for um, uh, the, the screening of blood, you will see that in both cases, the test will return a negative result. So the person is not having a stroke, but instead the person he's having a stroke because according to this, to the shape of this the type of, um, of system, that is related to how the blood flow. So to these experiments here, I'm not gonna go into the details. You can basically derive is basically the shape of, of this um, uh, clot providing information on the stroke. And you can basically use that as a prediction for as a diagnosis, as a biomarker for stroke. You may say, well, but this is theory, isn't it? You don't go into the hospital and they do that, wrong. You do, I actually go to the hospital and they do that because if you go at Morrison Hospital, there is an entire lab with this tool that are called rheometers, where you basically have, you see, this is a bottom plate. You put another plate on top and you do this, these experiments that I was telling you. So patients are actually taking, well, they, when they go there, they take blood and they run also this type of test to see whether they are having a stroke. So this is actual impact in something that is taking place and chemical engineers are having a leading role in this. Now, this is an example from uh, you know, Swans University. 
But also there is another thing to consider and is uh, related to this global challenge, sustainability, healthcare, climate change, and drinkable water. What's the position of the Institute of Chemical Engineering, which basically is the organ that is on top. So is the ensemble of all the chemical engineers. And by the way, the degree that that uh, is available here at Swans University is accredited by the Institute of Chemical Engineering. So what's their position? This is a very recent survey. This was in January 2021. So there is 84% of support across the academic community towards net zero. So in order to reach towards the, sorry, to the Paris Agreement, so of being at 1.5 degree Celsius uh, before to the pre-industrial level. So try to keep inside uh, this uh, range because we want to reduce emission. There has been also the uh, general agreement on the fact that emission reduction must start now. So we cannot wait anymore because if we wait, there are catastrophic conditions and we need to try to do as much as we can to remain below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And this message has been exactly repeated at COP26 that has been uh, held in Glasgow a few weeks ago. So this is really important. This is January, 2021. There is also position on sustainability. So especially, Akemi endorses the end of all forms of poverty and inequality while making sure that no one is left behind. This is exactly behind the concept of the drinkable water. If we cannot, if we leave people without water, we are generating inequality. And chemical engineers are taking a strong stand against inequality. We are trying to make a difference. We are delivering solutions to address global challenges. That's what we are doing at the moment. And then education, this is very important. So this is not something that you, know, you don't see during your degree and you just find elsewhere afterwards. This is embedded in education. And even more, the fact that sustainability, social responsibility, and ethics are embedded in the education and training of chemical engineers will be mandatory in accredited education and through continuous professional development, which means that since our degree is accredited, you can make sure that if you join us in Swansea and try to solve with us all these global issues and challenges, we will make sure that you will have built in your education package or the principle that you need to address those global challenges. So we can draw a few conclusions from, uh, from this. Our planet is experiencing critical problems that required immediate actions. So we cannot wait anymore. We need also to realize that chemical engineers are at the forefront. So we are exactly at the forefront to address these problems. They are also qualified, we are qualified and trained to deliver on proposed solution to global challenges. And we are not alone, is a global moment strongly supported by the Institute of Chemical Engineering. So there is a global effort led by chemical engineers in order to tackle these global challenges. So with that, I hope that I haven't taken too much of your time. I try to keep within the half an hour. So, and I thank you all very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer all uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Galdida. Oh, sorry, I completely messed up. Thank you so much. I'm speechless, I'm obviously. Um, I'm just seeing in the uh, participant, uh, the Avajit uh, has raised their hand. Um, they have a question. Avajit, if you can't put it in the Q&A, are you able to type a question to us in the chat? I'm not sure. I think we can we can allow him to talk. Ah, oh, brilliant! Yeah. Hold on, I will do friend. that. Okay, Avijit. So now you're allowed to talk. It's just unmute yourself. You can ask your question. I will be very happy to answer. Yes, yeah, sir. Good evening, sir. And I'm very pleased to uh, attend such astonishing event. However, my question is that uh, now we we are facing a, a globally chaotic situation due to due to plastic. Uh, pollution as you showed us uh, that most of the oceans are piled up uh, through through the uh, through through the plastic garbage patches and some of 
as as we also know about a pacific great pacific ocean garbage patch however yeah. uh, nowadays nowadays most of the company using that uh, these products are made from uh, this ocean plastic uh, don't you don't you reckon that it it isn't a a a a, a, a solution to uh, po- produce such products even after 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 um, uh, like after well, damage damage that product that that might also be an a pollution however what pull with the probable uh, reasons to solve about uh, plastic pollution i read some of the articles that a uh, scientist from usa has got some of uh, a, uh, i mean uh, what bacteria or like uh, i forget uh, uh, worm that that it's uh, plastic uh, so that won't be a solution for plastic what are the other other uh, solution to to uh, remove this plastic pollution however in my opinion plastic is not problem the problem is the way we are using it okay uh, can i answer yeah definitely De- definitely thank you sir thank you okay thank you very much first of all for um, for your question so it was very uh, important so um, the problem is so that plastic remains a problem. So it's not that you, we cannot just say that plastic is not a problem uh, because it, not all the plastic that we make can be recycled. That's one of the first problem. So plastics are is important. So the plastic is very important. And as it stands now in the world that we live, we cannot just get rid of it. Okay, so we cannot just from one day to the next say, we stop making plastics, okay? So then there are two ways of addressing the problem. So there is in one stream is that is the, the fact that you may say, we have already a lot of plastic, so what do we do with it? Okay, because we have already a lot of plastic that is accumulating in the sea and we need to do something about it. And what I, I presented you before was one potential solution. So it was something that has been developed here. But there are also other people that are making other type of, of a progress in that direction. Then there is another type of, um, of line of research where actually we said, well, hold on a minute, that plastic is bad, but not all the plastics are, de- are generally bad. So there has been some work in the past that basically they were able to derive some type of plastic that maybe they started to be more biodegradable. So it's something that is better. And the reason why it would be better to also act on the production chain is that you would, in the meantime, remove what we have. And with what you produce, you would contribute to um, save, well, basically to keep the cost of, um, not the cost of production, but the cost of the end product low compared to, you know, regular glass, for instance. Um, and at the same time, reducing the environmental impact. But as it stands, since not all the plastic is recyclable and only a fraction of that is recycled, plastic remain a problem. But I agree with you that there needs to be two streams of action. One towards solving the excess of plastic that we have now, and the other one towards solving the process. So basically at, at the start of the chain and in both cases, no matter how you look at this problem, chemical engineers are at the forefront there. Okay, so I, I hope this answered your question, and thank you very much for uh, for asking it. Thank you, thank you, Seth. Thank you for sharing, Abhijit. Is there any other questions about chemical engineering at Swansea University, or about any of the global challenges that we've discussed today? Don't be shy, I won't bite. Don't worry. Okay. Well, thank you for everybody who has attended and listened to the talk today. Um, Thank you so much. And if you do have any further questions, um, please refer to our website. We'll be posting this webinar on our One Step Ahead pages. Um, And also you can contact... um, Dr. Del Guidiche on his staff profile on the Swansea University website. Uh, his details are on there if you have any further questions about his talk today. So thank, thank you, you very everyone. much. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you in Swansea soon. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice evening. Thank you again.
拜拜。